to hit that button. I'm coming back to you, so I'll have more time. But I just want to note that on, on May 13th of 2021, a subcommittee uh, member here on Judiciary, uh, our colleague, Ms. Sheila Jackson Lee, who walked in the room, um, I'm going to quote you uh, because you said, and I think it's up on the, on the screen there, in essence, the brain doesn't fully mature until at least 25 years old. Does that tell us about high school students, middle schoolers, and yes, young people who may make rash or irreverent or spontaneous decisions? Should that be their life? Now, admittedly, she was saying this in the context of a, a criminal subcommittee hearing, but I think that is a, a, a truism. I think she stated an obvious fact that everybody should acknowledge. Unfortunately, um, I'm out of time. I'll have some more in a bit. Uh, the chair now recognizes Ms. Jackson Lee. How about that introduction? Mr. Johnson, thank you for giving me that gift. Um, you are absolutely right. Uh, that uh, hearing, if I might uh, quote it specifically, um, as the uh, chair of the committee, it was uh, made during a committee hearing entitled um, The Juvenile Justice Pipeline and the Road Back to Integration. The idea, Ms. Reynolds and Mr. Minter, was to save lives uh, from young people being incarcerated for life. Uh, and it was the individual young person making rash actions that would draw themselves into criminal life or criminal acts, should that be the rest of their life. So let me uh, not step away from the idea uh, that we want to save lives in many instances. Let me get to the point of this hearing, uh, since that was not relevant to this hearing and it was on a completely different topic. But let me get to this point. Uh, let me um, apologize uh, for a hearing that frightens me. Um, I have dealt with this issue for decades. And I dealt with a young man named David Ritchie, who was a gay young man, a young, young, young man, who in the place he lived, Texas, uh, his life uh, was not affirmed. Uh, he lived in a skin of uh, concern and fear. And ultimately, he was sodomized. And we introduced legislation of the David Ritchie anti-hate legislation because as a gay young man who lived life differently, he was not affirmed. Ultimately, even though he got past this case, he ultimately committed suicide. So let me, as I begin my questioning, tell you how fearful I am that the intervention of this committee on issues of private health care determination frighteningly label the trans community in a way that someone is being intimidated in fear uh, and concern for their life, or their personal thinking is that they're not worthy, they're not entitled to good health care, and that their life is not worth it. I insist on pronouncing today, your life is worth it. Your son's life is worth it. Daughter's life is worth it however they are transitioning and as they live their life. And I plea and beg for those who might be listening, know that we do not believe that this is a question for this committee. It is a question for health care, for your parent or loved one or guardian, uh, and as well, your personal determination. I will not pretend to be a scriptured person. I am not ordained. I'm not in any leading religious organization as a uh, religious leader, but I have spoken to persons who lead, and they've given me no evidence that this issue speaks to anyone's religion. Again, I don't pretend to know every aspect of everyone's faith, and in this country you practice as you desire. But I will not sit here and allow the trans community to be abused, uh, and in essence, to be rejected. And for someone somewhere, let me say, your life is worthwhile. Mr. Mentor, let me provide you with a question very quickly. My time is short. The Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment forbids states to deprive any person of life, liberty, or property. And the Supreme Court has stated this clause includes a substantive component that provides heightened protection against government interference. What does this mean to the interests the court stated that the interest of parents in the care and custody of control of their children is important. Please give what this means to you as you lead out in this community. Ms. Reynolds, please let us know what this meant to you for your son, for his, 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 his coming together, and how you needed the support of your community, your, your surrounding, 
and how important this is for the trans. Let me go to Mr. Mentor, please. And I'd ask the chairman for his indulgence so I had to respond to his commentary. Yes, Mr. Mentor. Thank you so much for your statement of support for this community. Kids need to hear that. Yes, these state bans are an unthinkable intrusion on the traditional, deeply rooted authority of parents to make medical decisions for their own children. And we're talking about obtaining established care. These are parents who know there's an effective treatment. They see their child suffering. To have the government come in and say, no, you cannot obtain this health care for your children is a shocking violation of parents' rights. Psychologically, Ms. Reynolds, if you can just bring it home to us what it really means and who somebody that's not in this room might be seeing what's going on here. I just want to highlight how incredibly difficult all of this was. Um, this is, no, again, nothing that we arrived on easily. There was nothing, nothing impulsive about any of this decision. It was made collaboratively with a team of trained professionals. There was a ridiculous amount of assessment that happened prior to that. This is not just some kind of fly-by-night. My kids said this one day, and then this whole thing launched. That is not how this went down. It was very, very, very careful. Are others impacted by listening to this quickly? Can you just say what impact, hearing that they are not affirmed? It's devastating. Gentle ladies, out of time. I yield back. Thank you. Thank you. And the chair 